This case, decided in the Court of Appeal in Chancery, is a trust case which teaches us that sometimes people who are not trustees may be liable when a trustee breaches their duties. The facts in this case are really complicated. There was a grandfather, William Addy. He died and left for each of his children an annuity, which means their share of his estate was invested and paid to them in annual instalments. When those children died, William Addy's grandchildren were to share their parents' annuities. Now, an annuity requires a trustee to hold the principal money in trust and to invest that money because it's not being paid out as a lump sum. The trustee must also pay the annual amounts. Initially, there were three trustees, but after some years, the sole remaining trustee was John William Addy, a son. He decided to take his share as a lump sum. For his sister Anne's share, he appointed her husband, Henry Barnes, as the sole trustee. John Addy was advised by a solicitor named Duffield, and Barnes was advised by a solicitor named Preston. Duffield warned Addy against making Barnes the sole trustee, but they went ahead anyway. Duffield introduced them to a stockbroker who invested the money. Later, Barnes withdrew all of his wife's trust money and used it as capital in his business. He went bankrupt. His kids were therefore left without any prospect of an annuity. They sued him and the two solicitors. The question for the court was whether the solicitors could be liable. They were not the trustees, but the trust arrangements which went so badly wrong were established on their advice. Lord Selborne's decision included a famous statement establishing what are known as the two limbs in Barnes and Addy. Third parties cannot be regarded as having duties to the trust beneficiaries unless those agents receive and become chargeable with some part of the trust property, or unless they assist with knowledge in a dishonest and fraudulent design on the part of the trustees. So the first way a trust party can become liable is by receiving and holding trust property. The second way is if they're actually assisting the dishonest trustee and they know that what the trustee is doing is dishonest. In this case, neither of the solicitors did either of these things, so they were not liable. 